Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We are wrapping up 1 Thessalonians today. This is one of those things you look at and you're like, oh man, 12 to 28, that's a lot of verses. They're so short. Don't worry. They're so short. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with verse 12 together. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor, uh, sorry, who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let's pray. Father, you are unbelievable. You are overwhelming. You are mighty. You are holy. You are righteous, you are good, you are loving, you are compassionate, and we are floored by all that you are and all that you have done. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you so much for being a God who reveals, a God who speaks, a God who has made himself known, a God who has already established a kingdom and who is coming back to permanentize that kingdom in all of creation. And Lord, we long for that day. As we think today about what it means to be your people, to be kingdom citizens in this world while we wait for the fulfillment of the kingdom. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would help us to understand what it looks like to be good kingdom citizens today, right now, while we await your return. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, like I said, we're wrapping up First Thessalonians together. It's always hard for me to finish a book. It always, I always feel good about finishing a book. Maybe you feel the same way when you study the Bible. You're like, I'm so happy I finished a book. But you're also like, oh, now it's over. It's, it's bittersweet for me. It's bitter because I want more. I want it to keep going. And some of you guys have already asked me, are we doing 2 Thessalonians next? There actually is more, Noah. We're actually not doing 2 Thessalonians next, though I'm planning to come back to it at some point in the future. So it's bitter because I, I hate finishing a book, but it's also sweet because I think it's a good time. It's a logical time to kind of look back on, on what God has been speaking to us for the last 11 weeks together as a church. And to look back, to think, to reflect on all that God has said and all that God is saying through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And I hope that he's going to do more of that this morning. We've been talking for 10 weeks now. This is week 11, I think, of what it means to be faithful to the end. What it means to live in faithfulness to the Lord until his return. And these final words at the end of chapter 5 of Paul's are as practical as it gets. Um, I love the way Paul writes letters. In almost every letter he writes, he starts out like with such deep, rich, theological gospel truths. And then he slowly transitions to, okay, now here's what that means for your life. Paul doesn't get it backwards like we so often do. Most of us, if we're going to pick a verse, or sorry, a chapter in Thessalonians to look at, we're going to look at chapter 5 because it's super practical and it's super easy. Practicality is great if you have the theological foundation. And that's what Paul has been doing and, and, and facilitating in this letter. And that's what he's uh, going to kind of bring to a climax at the end of this letter saying, now in light of all that Christ is, in light of his return, in light of the glories of that future day, in light of his resurrection, in light of all that that means for us here, this is how you as God's people are supposed to live today in anticipation of his return. We've spent the last few weeks talking about eternity, talking about the kingdom of God, talking about what it means for us to be part of that kingdom, to live as citizens of that kingdom. And and those things come together uh, in our passage this morning. And so here's our main idea this morning. This passage makes this truth super, super clear. Kingdom 
citizening begins now for God's people. Kingdom citizening begins now for God's people. Believe it or not, citizening is not a word, but it is a word now. I've made it a word. Okay, you guys don't write me emails. I know citizenship is a word. Okay, I'm aware of the existence of the word citizenship. I didn't like the word citizenship because I want to focus on the verb, not the noun. I want to think about what it means to live, to be actively citizening. Okay, to, to live out our citizenship. Sure, I could have said it that way, but I chose not to. I chose to make up a word. That's what I do instead. Okay, so I, that's what I want to talk about this morning, kingdom living. What it means to live as citizens and residents of the kingdom of God in, in a foreign land today for you and for me. So we've been talking for weeks now sort of about this, about Christ's eternal kingdom, about the fact that um, he has already established it, but that there is still the future glory and the future wonder of that day still coming. The totality, the full glory of the kingdom of God is not today. It is coming, though. It is promised. It is guaranteed. That's the kind of stuff we've been talking about. And if your faith is in Christ, you are already a citizen of that kingdom. In Philippians 3, 20, Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Couldn't sum up the book of 1 Thessalonians better than that verse. Our citizenship is in heaven, not our citizenship will be in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, and yet we are still awaiting our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if this is news to you or not, but we're not in heaven yet. Not the fullness of it, and yet we are citizens of God's kingdom right now. Right now, if your faith is in Christ, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. That's where we're from, that's where we're going, that's where we belong, and it's where we're going to spend all of eternity. And so as we await our Savior, we need to spend our lives kingdom citizening living as good citizens in the way that God intends within his kingdom that has already begun. And so for us, for God's people, for the church, kingdom citizenship, kingdom citizening begins today. It begins now. It begins at the moment of your conversion, the moment that you trust in Christ and put your faith in Christ. There is a transformation that takes place. And you're no longer a citizen of this world. You become a citizen of God's eternal kingdom. And I think this passage is Paul trying to show the church, look, I've, I've talked you guys ears off about this. You know this is true. Here's how you're supposed to live in light of those realities. And so with that said, I'm going to give you this morning seven realities about what kingdom living looks like in the church community. Seven things for you and I to strive for now, today. Today, right now, as kingdom citizens. So let's start with verses 12 through 13. Read with me. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. This is really the reason I am preaching through 1 Thessalonians. It's just to get to these verses so, you, so I can tell you to respect and esteem your spiritual leaders, okay? The people who are laughing hopefully are the ones who know me best. This is the first thing that Paul says, right? He starts getting into the very practical realities of church life. And again, remember, we're talking in terms of kingdom living. We're talking in terms of what it means to be faithful until the end, to live a life of faithful godliness until the end. And the very first thing that Paul mentions as a way for the church to begin doing this and embracing kingdom life now within this church community is by respecting and esteeming and loving those who labor, over, labor among you and are over you in the Lord. He's talking about church leaders. And I think specifically he's talking about the elders of the church. The ones who labor and pray and teach and love and serve and shepherd tirelessly the flock of God. This is what pastors are. It's where the word comes from. To be a shepherd. That's what pastors and elders are. They are God's under shepherds, under the great shepherd, Christ Jesus, shepherding, caring for, loving, teaching the flock of God. That's all of us, the flock. So if churches and if Christians want to be faithful to the end, they need healthy, godly pastors pastoring them. 
I don't know if you realize that or not, but that is a need that you have. It's a need that I have. It's a need that we have. We are sheep. Sheep need shepherds. And we have the good shepherd, the great shepherd in Christ Jesus. And he has ordained and he has established the office of pastor elder to be his under shepherds, pastoring and caring and loving the flock in this world. So because that's true, because sheep need a shepherd, because shepherds are a basic need for sheep, the people of God are instructed here to respect and esteem church leadership. So that's the first point in your notes. Kingdom citizens respect and esteem church leadership. In Hebrews 13, Christians are told to remember their leaders, imitate their leaders, obey them, submit to them, and the reason given is because they watch over your souls and will give an account. There is nothing more scary to me as a pastor than that day where I will have to give an account for my sheep and I'll have to walk the Lord through my sheep. That's what pastoring is. This is why if this has always baffled me. When I was 19 and I was just starting out in college and I was learning what the word pastor meant and I was attending this mega church at the time where you literally couldn't get a meeting with the pastor if you wanted to. Like you weren't allowed to get a meeting with the pastor. What? That's not pastoring. Pastoring is when you know the sheep and the sheep know the pastor and they know, their, know his voice and he knows them and he knows their needs and what's going on in their lives. This is what the Lord has called us to. And there's going to be a day where I'm going to stand before the great shepherd and I'm going to say, here's how I took care of your sheep. And so if you wonder why I take church membership seriously, if you wonder why I take preaching seriously, if you wonder why I take getting to know you all and loving you all seriously, that is a lot of why, A, because it's what God has called me to do and I love it, and B, because I'm going to stand before the Lord and I'm going to give an account one day. And so because that's true in Hebrews, it says, remember your leaders, imitate their faith, obey them, submit to them. In 1 Peter 5, it says Christians are to be subject to the pastor elders of the church. In 1 Timothy 5, Christians are instructed to show double honor to the pastor elders, and then you add in this passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13 to the list, and you have a pretty good, clear picture of what it means to respect and esteem highly in love your pastor elders. The word esteem means to have high regard for. The word respect means to cherish or to pay attention to. And so I want to talk really quickly about these things. The first thing, healthy churches have a high regard for their pastors. This means showing them honor. Respect, kindness, care, compassion. It means showing them the benefit of the doubt. And by the way, I'm not just talking about me right now. I want to be clear. I'm talking about the spiritual leaders of the church. I'm not just talking about Noah. I'm not just talking about Noah and Craig. I'm talking about the elders of the church. And it, FYI, it is kind of uncomfortable to talk about, just so you know. Like, it's kind of weird up here being like, respect me. I hope you know that's not what I'm doing. I'm, I'm reading to you the Lord's instruction for churches and how we ought to uh, to regard our pastor elders, and this goes for me too. This goes especially, I think, for me to show our elders a love and respect. So it means uh, all the things I just said. It means maybe holding off on that critical comment if it doesn't need to be said, if it's not helpful, if it's not said in love, if it's not uplifting. It means remembering and understanding that pastor elders are humans and that they're husbands and that they're fathers and that they can't be everywhere and that they can't do everything, and that they can't know everything. You'd be surprised how often in ministry, uh, just like my wife, people expect me to just know what they want or to know what they need. I'm not a superhuman, okay? Did you guys, you guys thought I was? Aw, uh, just kidding. It just means remembering and respecting the fact that they have families, that they are humans. It means respecting their hearts, their minds, their words, their insight, their families, their kids, and their leadership as much as you possibly can. Healthy churches have a high regard for their pastor elders. And the second thing is this word to esteem highly in love. Again, this word means to cherish. The word, root of the word actually means to see, like to really see or to be aware of. And so Paul instructs the church to be aware of them with a high level of love, to see them with a high level of love. That's what cherishing is, isn't it? If you say, I cherish my wife, that's really what you mean. You don't just mean I love her. That's a different word. 
What you mean is you lovingly, you see her, you care about her, you pay attention to her, you're giving that kind of, of love to her. And that's part of what kingdom citizening looks like in a church, and it's part of what being a healthy church looks like, is cherishing our pastor elders, respecting them, appreciating them, encouraging them. I don't know if you guys know this, but ministry is hard. Pastoral ministry is hard. I love you guys. I love it tremendously. It's hard. I love my kids. Parenting is hard. I love my kids. Holding a screaming baby for five hours is hard. And pastoral ministry is much the same. It's hard. It's exhausting. And it's wonderful. And just like my wife needs to be told, of, Alyssa, I hope you're watching, you're doing a great job. Just like I need to be told as a father, maybe even on Father's Day, you're doing a great job. Pastors need to hear those kind of things too. Shepherds need to hear those kind of things too, okay? And the last thing that Paul says here uh, is, that I think is awesome that he includes this here about how you can respect and esteem your elders is he says, be at peace among yourselves. Right? If I want my kids to show me in a couple of years, maybe even now, if I want my kids to show me a good, respectful, happy, like a good Father's Day for me, you know what it's going to be? Leave me alone. <laughs> Stop bickering. Stop whining. Stop doing the gut punch to each other like we've talked about. Stop arguing. Stop throwing stuff at each other. Stop doing the exact opposite of what I just told you to do. Right? As a parent, those things drive you crazy. And as a pastor, those things drive you crazy. Paul's saying one of the best things to do if you want to uh, facilitate health in your church, if you want to be kingdom citizening now, is to just stop fighting. Be at peace among yourselves. We have got the world against us. We have got the devil against us. We do not need to be against each other. I do not need you to be against each other. You do not need to be against each other. Be at peace among yourselves. So kingdom citizening means respecting and esteeming your church leaders because sheep need shepherds if they want to be faithful to the end. Like it or not, that's the truth. If you want to live the faithful Christian life until the end, you need a shepherd. You need shepherds to know you and to care for you and to love you and to teach you. Let's move on. Verse 14. You guys are like, are we going to talk about this all morning? Nope. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. These are all realities in, in, in struggles in the body of Christ, right? Idleness, faint-heartedness, weakness. At different times, any of us, all of us could probably be considered any of these things. And part of the beauty of the community of the God that is if I, a community of God is if I'm weak, there is someone strong in the body. That if I'm faint-hearted, there is someone encouraging in the body. That if I am idle, there is someone to admonish me in the body. In the body of Christ, the weak and the strong are bound together. They are yoked together so that when one is weak, the strong can help carry that burden. And this work, dealing with the idle and the faint-hearted and the weak, it always requires patience. So this is the next point in your notes. Kingdom citizens patiently give strength to the weak. Romans 15, 1 through 2 says, we who, have, we, ha we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and, do, and to not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good and build him up. Part of kingdom citizening in the body of Christ means that we have an obligation to be strong for the weak. That means there's a communal obligation. Do you hear that? There's an obligation that you have as a, as a part of the body of Christ to be strong for the weak, to be admonishing for the idle, to be encouraging for the faint-hearted. That's an obligation that you have, that we have to the body. And gosh, again, if we're going to be faithful to the end, we're going to need that. And we're going to need humility to recognize sometimes we're going to have to patiently be strong to the weak. And we're also going to need humility to realize that sometimes we're the weak. And we need to accept strength from the body. And honestly, I don't know which one of those is harder to do. Both are difficult. It takes a lot of humility to patiently bear with someone who is weak and faint-hearted and idle. It also takes a lot of humility to receive help from the strong. 
to acknowledge that you are weak and that you need help. And yet, this is, these are kingdom realities in this life. While sin plagues us, these are kingdom realities within a church that we need to both humbly offer strength to those ailed by these various weaknesses and that we sometimes are going to be the weak one who needs strength from the rest of the body. And so in short, you have that phrase there, build one another up. Kingdom citizens, they, that's what they do. They build one another up. They look around the room and they build one another up. And again, if that's not happening, you know how difficult it's going to be to be faithful to Christ until the end. If you've come to church and you feel like you're getting zapped, or you come to church and you feel like nobody here cares about me, nobody here can help me when I'm weak, nobody here can be strong for me, nobody here will pray for me, nobody here can build me up. If that's the sense that you get, you're not going to last long in the Christian faith. We need each other. It's an obligation, Paul says, that we have to one another. So that's what kingdom citizens do. They give strength to the weak. Next verse 15. See that no one repays anyone. No one, anyone. Does that leave any space? Nope. No one, anyone, evil for evil, but always seek to do good to, the, to, an, uh, to, another, to one another and to everyone. Newsflash, this might be breaking news for you, not sure. Human beings, when they get together, redeemed or not, when they do life together in church, when they live in the same house together, when they're in their same community group together, there's going to be strife. There's going to be frustration. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be arguments. We're a family. Families argue. Families fight about things. Families push one another sometimes. Families disagree about things. Families bother one another. Trust me. The phrase I was just telling Christina, I've been saying to Ezra over and over and over again this week is stop bothering Thomas. He, that's all he's doing. He's only doing it to bother him. We do the same thing in the church. And we do worse. We don't just bother each other. Sometimes we sin against each other. We hurt each other. Sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. And what Paul is making clear is what Christ has made very clear is that in Christ's kingdom, retaliation is not an option. Retribution is not an option. Revenge is not an option. Repaying evil for evil is not an option. But that's what we want to do, right? That's what our sinful nature wants to do. When Ezra runs past Thomas and bumps him over, you know what Thomas does? He gets up and he goes. <laughs> He's not anywhere near him. Ezra's gone. But Thomas is lashing out. He wants to hit back. That's our nature. That doesn't change as we get older. But Christ is clear. Paul is clear. There is absolutely no space for that in the body of Christ. No space for revenge, retribution, or anything like it. In Christ's kingdom, we are commanded to forgive and to do good when someone hits us. You know what I would love to see? I would love to see Ezra accidentally run past Thomas and knock him over, and Thomas sit, walk over to him and say, here's a hug and a cookie. And we laugh because there's no way on earth that's going to happen. But that should happen in the body of Christ. That's the way that we ought to respond to one another when there is hurt, when there is frustration in the body. So this is the next point. Kingdom citizens show forgiveness and goodness to those who wrong them. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, if you forgive your others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You think God takes forgiveness seriously? There's no room for unforgiveness in the teaching of Jesus. In Ephesians 4, Paul writes this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Get rid of all of it, Paul says. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Treat people like Jesus treats people. Totally, right? We're all like, yeah, duh. Obviously, that's what I'm trying to do. And yet, almost all of us, are, are harboring unforgiveness of some kind. There's no option. It's not an option in the kingdom of Christ is to hold on to unforgiveness. And then lastly, Jesus teaches this in Luke 6. He says, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away uh, your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. You get the point. Jesus is clear. 
the way that Christians, the way that people in God's kingdom respond to harm being done against them is the way that Jesus did, which is praying for them and blessing them and loving them and forgiving them and doing good to them. That needs to typify our church community. There is no place for unforgiveness in this body. You get that? No place. And so I'm telling you right now, if you are harboring, if you, are, if you say you're a follower of Jesus, and you say, I'm a citizen of this kingdom, and you are harboring resentment and bitterness and wrath and malice and anger and all these other things, stop. Forgive them. Look to Christ. Look at what Christ has done. Look at your sin. Look at all that you have done to Christ. And look at how he has forgiven and shown grace and shown goodness and prayed for you. And then do that to that person. That is kingdom citizening, being kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven us. Failure to live this way is only going to wreak havoc on the kingdom citizens of City Park. If we live in unforgiveness, it is going to destroy us. Verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We ask this question, you, what's God's will for my life? Right? Nick talked about this when he preached. What's God's will for my life? Also, I want to apologize on behalf of Nick. If any of you were offended and you do pray, trying to decide where you choose, where you're going to go to lunch. And Nick, I think, gave the option between, was it torchies and chilies? The option is torchies. That's the right decision. You don't need to pray about that. You go to torchies and you get the queso. Anyways, we ask this question, right? What is the will of God for my life? The will of God for your life is rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. Kingdom citizens unceasingly embody joyfulness, prayerfulness, and thankfulness. Do you? Are you unceasingly embodying joy, prayer, and thankfulness? I'm not, but I should be. I should be. I should increase. I should grow. Part of kingdom citizening is recognizing that God is sovereign and that God is good. You may not like to hear those things over and over again, but those are pretty important truths about who God is. And if God is not both of those things, if he is not both sovereign and good, it's going to be really hard for you to rejoice always and pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. But he is good and he is sovereign. So to be a kingdom citizen is to rejoice always, always, always in who God is, in what God has done, and in how God has established a relationship by the blood of Christ with you. Always rejoice in that. To be a kingdom citizen is to commune constantly with God. Unfortunately for many of us, this is your communion with God. Right now, right here, and then none throughout the week. That's, you can't, that, that, that's not sustainable. You're going to die your spiritual life is going to wither. You're going to become a corpse. You need to be communing with God all the time, thinking of him, dwelling on him, speaking to him, listening to him all the time. And to be a kingdom citizen is to show thankfulness to God in all circumstances, even when it's awful, even when life is awful, even when your health is awful, even when your work is awful even when things in the family life are awful, even when all of those things are crumbling and falling apart, showing thanks to God always. Kingdom citizens unceasingly embody joyfulness, prayerfulness, and thankfulness. And no doubt that kind of living is going to instill in us the ability to continue in faithfulness until the end. And by the way, this is what we're going to be doing for all of eternity. Did you know that? If this doesn't sound good now, this is what eternity is going to be. Rejoicing always in who God is and what has, God has done. Communing with God always. Showing gratitude and worship and thankfulness to him always. This is what we're going to spend eternity doing. So we start now. That's what Paul's saying. Verses 19 through 20. Do not quench the spirit. I've had worship pastors quote this to me, Mark. Anytime they want to just keep singing. Do not quench the spirit. <laughs> It's like, okay, yeah, maybe. Maybe that's the spirit moving. I don't think that's necessarily what Paul means here. Don't quench the spirit. Next verse, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Part of what makes the church the church, much of what makes the church the church, is God's spirit working through God's word in and among God's people. 
The word quench here is literally the word extinguish, like to put out a fire. Like when you're camping and you dump, dump a bucket of water on the coals or on the fire. That's what Paul's talking about. He's saying don't extinguish the spirit. If you want discipleship and growth and maturity and faithfulness to die in a church, quench the spirit. Put it out. Because God's spirit is a fire that God has placed within his body. His spirit is a fire that ignites and fans the flames of holiness and obedience and godliness and Christian living in God's people. To quench the spirit is to douse all of that. It's to extinguish holiness and godliness and Christian living and Christian maturity in the people of God. Don't quench the spirit. If God's spirit isn't working and God's spirit isn't igniting his people, we will fizzle and die. We will become a lifeless corpse without God's spirit working and breathing life into us. So that's the first thing he says. Don't quench the spirit. The second thing he says, which is connected to it, is do not despise prophecies. People would interpret this differently. Fundamentally, what a prophecy is, is the word of God. It's a declaration or a proclamation of God's word. And you know what we have right here? We have a proclamation of God's word. We have a declaration, a complete work of God's revelation of himself and God's word for his people. The primary way that God speaks and that God's spirit ignites his people is through the proclaimed word of God. And so this is the next point in your notes. Kingdom citizens are ignited by the power of God's spirit through the proclamation of God's word. And Paul says if we quench the spirit and we despise prophecies, we despise the proclaimed word of God, if we stop listening intently and yearning for the word of God, we will become a lifeless corpse. Life will leave this body. Life will leave us if we quench the spirit and we despise the proclamation of God's word. Now, God's spirit works in a ton of wonderful ways that we don't have time to talk about and that isn't here in this passage. But what Paul's doing is connecting the work of the spirit with the work of the word, how the spirit and the word are interconnected. It shows us that he wants us to understand this truth that Christians, kingdom citizens, are ignited by the power of God's spirit through the proclamation of God's word. Do you know what the word spirit even means? It's the word pneuma, which means wind or breath. Okay, so there is an intricate connection between the spirit of God, the breath of God, and the word of God. Paul wants us to see the link between these two things. And so again, you put all this together, and Paul is basically saying, listen to the voice of God. Do not ever stop listening to the voice of God. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the word. And then he says, the last thing here, test everything. You know what doesn't need testing is God's word. You know what does need testing is Pastor Noah. You know what does need testing is anybody who might be speaking the word of God. Anybody who you might be listening to on the radio or on a podcast or on Instagram or wherever you're listening to your, your pastors or your preachers or your spiritual instructors or whatever book you're reading. They do need testing. Okay, God's word doesn't need it. We do. I want to be really quick here. John Stott gives us five helpful ways to test these messages. So you might be like, how do I do that? What does that even mean to test these things? Okay, these are the five things that John Stott gives us. The plain truth of scripture is the first one. If what you're hearing does not align with the scriptures, stop listening. Okay, it's not from God. The second one is the person of Jesus. If what you're hearing and that it's claiming to be from God does not fit with who Christ is, the, the person, the revealed person of Jesus, stop listening. The third is the gospel of grace. If what you're hearing doesn't fit with the gospel, if it doesn't fit with the message of the grace of God, stop listening. The fourth one is the character of the speaker. Does it matter who it is? It matters that you know who that person is who's speaking to you. That matters. And then the fifth thing is the edification quality of the message. Was the body built up? Are you being built up? And so not one of these things in and of themselves isn't sufficient, but all of these things together, he's saying, is how you test prophecies, how you test the spirit, how you test whether or not a word of God is a word of God. 
Now, you might, you're like, uh, I, what do you mean testing? Like, you should be testing. When you hear a message from me or from somebody, you know what I'm doing? I'm standing up here and I'm saying, I have a message from God for you. That's what I'm saying when I stand up here. And therefore, you better listen. You better pay attention. You better filter every single thing I say through all five of these things. Otherwise, you're going to probably at some point find yourself caught up in the midst of false teaching. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying that's reality. Are you with me? Okay, cool. Thanks, Julia. I could talk about this all day. I could talk about this all day. You need to test. Man, I, I saw a lady um, come through the doors not that long ago with her Joyce Meyer study Bible. And I, I wanted to just take it and throw it in the garbage. Any Joyce Meyer study Bibles out there? Throw it in the garbage. There's false teachers out there. There's people claiming to speak on behalf of God Almighty who are not speaking truth, who are not saying things that are right and true about who Christ is, about the gospel of grace. You need to be careful what you intake. You need to be careful what you listen to. So that's why Paul says these things. You need to listen to the word of God. You need to be open to the word of God. You need to not despise the word of God and not quench the word of God, but you need to make sure it's the word of God. Does that make sense? That's what kingdom citizens do. Verses 22 and 23. And uh, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the spirit is working and the, and the word of God is being proclaimed, the fruit of the spirit will be produced in God's people, which means we will be steadily, increasingly ab abstaining from every form of sin every form of evil, and embracing every form of holiness. This is what Paul says here. He says, we also will experience a complete sanctification as the God of peace and his spirit work among us. And we will be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the next point in your notes is that kingdom citizens abandon every form of sin and embrace every form of holiness. This is what Christian living is in a nutshell, isn't it? Running from sin, fleeing sin, and running toward Christ and holiness. And I've got good news for you. By the power of the blood of Christ, by the power of God's own spirit at work in you, he has instilled within you by faith the ability to overcome sin, to conquer sin, to battle and be victorious over sin because Christ battled and was victorious over sin. Do you have that same power by the Holy Spirit in and among you and in this body, which means that you are free from bondage to sin. You are empowered in Christ to be free from bondage to sin, which means you can abstain from sin. You're not hopeless. If your faith is in Christ and you have the Holy Spirit, you can fight sin and you can overcome sin because Christ has fought and overcome sin. And we don't just run from something, we run to something, we run to Christ, and we run to holiness. That's what kingdom citizens do. And then lastly, last point here in your notes, verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. What a great verse. What an important verse in the context of all that we're talking about. That God's, uh, God works through his spirit, he works through the proclamation of his word to produce godliness and holiness within us so that we might be well adorned and well prepared for the king's return. And again, this is really good news for us. I talked about this last week, that we can have confidence and assurance that God will keep us until that day, that God will keep his people who he has called prepared, holy, righteous on that day of Christ's return because he is faithful. He will surely do it. That's good news. You start hearing all these instructions, right? Do this, do this, do this, do this. And you start to get overwhelmed again, right? Going, I can't do this. And Paul is so quick to remind us of the gospel, to remind us that your place in eternity, your place in God's family, in God's household, in God's kingdom is not secured because of your holy living. You need to live a holy life. That's not what secures your place in God's kingdom. What secures your place in God's kingdom is the faithfulness of the king. He who has called you is faithful. He will surely do it. And kingdom citizens delight in that truth.
This is the last point in your notes. Kingdom citizens delight in God's faithfulness to them. That is a truth worth relishing and delighting in. To know, like I talked about last week, that your salvation is entirely and totally and completely secure in Christ. And if you think that it's not, you're saying Christ can't keep his people. Or Christ, worse, won't keep his people. You're saying Christ isn't faithful. He is faithful. And he will surely do it. And then Paul concludes the letter with some personal remarks. He says, brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I should have done that earlier. I asked you guys to do that instead. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. You wonder if there's, like, why is he commanding so firmly that, <laughs> that it be read? Make sure everybody hears this message. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He asks the church to pray for them. He greets all the brothers. He wants to make sure that this whole letter gets read to the whole church. And he speaks the grace of Christ over this church that he loves and that he had pastored and that he had planted. Being faithful to the end is what we've been talking about for the last 11 weeks. And being faithful to the end means kingdom citizening. From the day of our conversion until the day of Christ's return or our death. Kingdom citizening includes everything we've talked about this morning. It includes everything we have talked about all throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians. And so as we conclude this book, I just, I hope and I pray that both for you and for me, these truths of who Christ is and the, of, of his return and of that day will be more present on our hearts and minds than they were before. And I guarantee you, you will be well served, better served in your faith if you keep the return of Christ more at the forefront of your mind than you have. And I want to conclude with this quote from J.I. Packer. I've been on a J.I. Packer binge recently. Here's what he says in his book called Growing in Christ. Be ready, said the Savior to his disciples. How does one get and stay ready? By keeping short accounts with God and men, by taking life one day at a time as Jesus told us to, and by heeding this advice, live each day as if thy last. Budget and plan for an ordinary span of years, but in spirit be packed up and ready to leave at any time. This should be part of our daily devotional discipline. When the Lord comes, he should find his people praying for revival and planning for world evangelism, but packed up and ready to leave nonetheless. May that embody who we are as God's people. Praying for revival, planning for world evangelism, uh, scattering seeds and discipling people and raising up leaders and packed and ready to go for when Christ returns. So I hope our study in 1 Thessalonians has been helpful. I hope it's helped us learn better how to keep short accounts with God and men, how to take one day at a time, how to live each day as if our last, and how to be packed up and ready to go because that's the message of 1 Corinthians. Christ is coming. Be ready. Be prepared. Be ready to go. And let the way our lives, uh, we conduct our lives in this world, proclaim the message of Revelation, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Come, come, Lord Jesus. We long for your return. We long for the goodness and the glory of that day. Lord, I think about my, my three-year-old son who was just crying last night because he was worried that he wasn't going to have his toys in heaven. And I think, Lord, about how often so many of us do the same thing. We think, oh, I, don't want, I don't really want that. I'm not really ready for that. I think life here is too good. Or there's too many things I want to do, too many places I want to see, or too many experiences I want to have. Lord, forgive us. We don't understand. That's what I just kept realizing with Ezra. He doesn't understand how good this day is going to be. And so many of us, that's the case. We don't think about how good this day is going to be. We don't get it. Lord, help us use 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2 and, and 3 and 4 and 5 and use the truths of 2 Thessalonians and, and Revelation and all of these glorious truths about what that day is going to be like. Use those truths, Lord, to help us long for that day. To, to say, come, Lord Jesus, and to mean it, for that to be the great desire of our hearts, that we be with you again, that you be with us, that you reign for all of eternity with your perfect, holy, and permanent kingdom. Lord, we long for that day. And help us in the meantime to be good kingdom citizens. Help us to understand what that looks like, what it means to live as your people here and now in this life, in this world. And Lord, I ask specifically for the people of City Park Church, for the people in this room, that you would work in our hearts and minds, that you would use your spirit uh, and the proclaimed word of God 
to help us see and understand and actually empower us to live the kind of way that you want us to live as kingdom citizens, to show uh, the kind of godliness that we've seen in this chapter to one another all the time, to embody that as a community. Lord, I pray that for City Park Church. I pray that for my family. I pray that for my life personally. And Lord, I just want to end this morning's service and I want to end my prayer by just saying thank you. Thank you for all that you are. Thank you for all that you have done. Lord, we praise you and we want to rejoice always in who you are. We want to commune with you always because you are so righteous and so good. We want to give thanks all the time. Lord, help us to embody that spirit as we sing to you now. It's in Christ's name we pray.